Hi. Oh, you guys are so excited. That's a beautiful smile. All right, I got one. We're good. All right. My name is Alex Lockwood, and we are going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. I had the pleasure of working on this for uh, over five years, and uh, I am sure that you all have heard of it. When I gave this talk a few years ago, it was, eh, have you heard of Webb? Well, if you haven't heard of Webb, you've heard of Hubble, right? Let's go from there. Now I can safely say that you all know what the James Webb Space Telescope is, which is a beautiful thing and means I did my job correctly. And uh, so let's dig into it. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is a giant infrared mission. It launched on Christmas morning of 2021 out of French Guiana. Uh, that is the European spaceport that is down there because one of our international partners is the European Space Agency along with NASA. And the other one is the Canadian Space Agency. Um, both of these agencies contributed one of the science instruments on the telescope. And we also got the rocket, an Ariane 5 rocket, from the European Space Agency. This thing is so big that we needed the European Space Agency's rocket just to get it into space. At the time that Webb was conceived, we did not have a rocket big enough to even fathom sending it into space. And even folded up, it was still a very tight fit in the world's largest rocket at the time, the Ariane 5. It's hard to imagine on this image right here, even though we are on the beauty of this giant hyperwall screen, much bigger than your typical TV, but even then, it doesn't do justice to the size of this thing. It is as tall as a house and as large as a tennis court. All of this in order to achieve the scientific goals that it set out to do, which include finding the very first galaxies ever created in the universe, studying and understanding the evolution of galaxies through the cosmic universe, the age of the universe, studying the formation and evolution of stellar and planetary systems, and discovering, studying, and really characterizing planets in our own solar system and those in other solar systems called exoplanets. I am happy to say that each of these images is an actual data set from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, each of these images came out in a set um, of news releases that happened in July. And from the get-go, the first time that we shared with the public what James Webb was capable of, we demonstrated that indeed it can both meet and exceed the expectations in all of it, these science categories. So since then, it's been six, eight, months, something on that. I can't do the math super quickly in my head, um, but it's been quite a ride. So let's talk some about the scientific discoveries. This is the very first image that was ever released from the telescope. Uh, the name for this gravitational lensing cluster is SMAX 0723, means absolutely nothing. Um, but what's going on here is that there are a cluster of galaxies, galaxies being sort of the most massive units in the, sol in the universe, and galaxies, as opposed to stars, tend to cluster. So while relatively you may have one star here and one star in Chicago, galaxies tend to cluster much closer, like DC and Baltimore, and actually even much closer relatively. So you will get these clusters of galaxies that form, and well, galaxy is a very large, massive unit in the universe, clusters of galaxies are actually the most massive sort of units in the solar system. This gravity actually serves to bend light around it. So gravity from any object will bend space-time itself, and what it does when you have such massive objects is light gets bent around massive objects. We call this a gravitational lens. It's like, it's like a magnifying lens. If you were to look at something, light bends through a magnifying glass, focuses to reveal what is behind it at a much higher amplification. Same thing with this gravitational lens. You actually get objects that are behind the lens amplified in magnitude, so you see them better, but they also kind of get distorted. So you'll see 
what you see kind of here, these weird, we call them sometimes tadpole galaxies or these curved, also called lensed galaxies, that's telling you that we're actually seeing objects that are behind this main cluster. And some of these galaxies that are behind this main cluster, we would not be able to see if it weren't for the augmentation from this cluster, from this gravitational lens, from this magnifying glass. So even in this image, which was the first image that we took with James Webb of the deep universe, and I was on the team that planned these observations, we were not trying to see anything magnificent. We said, hey, there's a gravitational lensing cluster out there. Let's see what we get. We looked at it for a few hours, and we actually ended up finding galaxies from 13 billion years ago, which would advance if... Oh, there we go. Oh, go back. Okay. So we actually found, in our first image ever, galaxies from 13 billion years ago which is incredible. These same galaxies from 13 billion years ago, it would take Hubble a week to find the same galaxy. And it took James Webb about half a day. That was the difference from the get-go in the power of Webb. But even more interestingly, and we'll take questions at the end, even more interestingly, is that Webb not only can see the galaxies, but it can characterize them. For the first time, we looked at galaxies and we knew what was inside of them. We could understand what galaxies from 13 billion years ago were comprised of. In this case, oxygen, hydrogen, neon, basic elements from a long, long time ago before you know, all of the time elapsed to synthesize even more complex molecules. But this is the first spectra of a galaxy at redshift of eight and higher. And it was easy for Webb. This just scratched the surface of what Webb can do. So Webb, in its first image, saw a galaxy from 13 billion years ago. Awesome, we weren't even trying. Then we tried. And within a couple of months, we found the oldest galaxy ever. The record for Hubble, Hubble's oldest galaxy, was at a redshift of about 12, which I know means nothing to you, but here you can see the number 12.5, just for comparison. What that actually means in terms of age of the universe is that Hubble had discovered a galaxy that was from about 400 million years after the Big Bang. After three months, Webb found one that was 350 million years after the Big Bang. Well, what's the difference? If you think of the age of the universe like a 100-year-old person. If the universe is a 100-year-old person, then a 400-million-year-old galaxy is about one years old. And if you've ever had kids, you know that the difference between a one-year-old and a 10-month-old and a five-month-old is huge. Same thing with the universe. If we want to understand the beginning of the universe, Hubble's limit of being able to study only up to 400, years after the big 400 million years after the Big Bang not good enough. So Webb, 350 million years after the Big Bang, right out of the gate. And then, of course, it got better. So just in December, new results came out, giving us two galaxies even older than that. We now have a galaxy at a redshift of 13. Again, that means nothing to you. But we are looking at a galaxy from about 200, 250 million years after the Big Bang. So here, we have, we have halved the age of the youngest galaxy. We are getting closer and closer to the beginning of the universe. And this mission is only six months old. So, I, I, it, it's hard to not pause after talking about the first galaxies ever discovered in the universe. But we move on. So, the, the, another capability of Webb is to understand galaxies uh, in a whole new light, literally and figuratively. The image on the right, or left, left here, is of Stefan's quintet. It's a series of five galaxies. Four of them are actually sort of co-located, and then this one on the left is actually in the foreground. Um, but it's a beautiful set of galaxies that was studied by Hubble, and a lot of things were understood about this galaxy system and this interacting galaxies. We looked at it with Hubble. These are two different pictures. This is near-infrared and mid-infrared and they're totally different. And yet, the complementary information that we get 
between this and this and what we've seen with the Hubble Space Telescope tells us so much about the physics, about the dynamics, about the chemistry of what's going on in these galaxies. Not only do we understand the galaxies themselves more, but we understand how they interact, how they merge, which is really what governs the evolution of galaxies throughout time. And then we get to by far my favorite image ever in the entire universe, the Carina Nebula. I'm sure you all took a moment when you saw this at first. It has literally you know, made, made the cover of the New York Times and, and been everywhere, not just because it's a breathtaking image, but because the detail that you can see here in a very simple snapshot of the universe tells you more in a single image than you know, what they say a thousand words can tell you. So this image, in addition to being breathtaking, actually has so much information on it that for the past six months, scientists have been studying it for its scientific value. I took this image, it was not meant for its scientific value, it was meant for its beauty, which it definitely conveys. But one thing we noticed from the get-go in this image was that if you zoom in right on the cliffs here, we call these the cosmic cliffs, if you zoom in on this image right here, there's a newborn star being formed right here. And we have actually caught a very small portion of the newborn star's life in which it is emitting material out of the young star. So as a star forms and accretes material in kind of a disk, so it kind of forms a donut of material, and all of the material ends up forming in the same plane, which is also why our solar system is in one plane, because that's how, how planetary systems form. As that process happens and that disk forms, material falls onto the central star and ends up kicking out jets that are perpendicular in both directions. It only happens for a very short amount of time in the star's lifetime, but we actually captured that here such that if you look into the image and you can you look at the whole image and you can find the two pieces, but within the image you can actually see one of the shocks of the bottom half as the material from the young star has shot into the nebula. You can see the bow shock, and then you can actually see the ejecta coming through. And so we can actually study the physics of this object just as it penetrates into the nebula and into deep space. The fact that we caught this just by chance is incredible, and it just goes to show you know, what is out there to be found if you are looking, if you are looking with a powerful tool like Web. It, it gives me chills. Another amazing image that we took of a similar type of system, a forming star system, is this of LHS 45, 475, I believe it is. Anyways, this is a similar system where you're looking and this actually right here is the disk of material. This is a donut right here that is obscuring your view of a young star. And then you see these jets of material that are streaming out. So it's, it's the same thing that was happening within the nebula that was oriented like this in the previous picture, but now it's here and you can see all of the gas and dust lit up from this object. And we can really study what's going on as the stars forming and interacting with all of this material. We could never see this with Hubble. And then a similar star-forming region, and one I would be remiss to omit, is the Pillars of Creation in the Eagle Nebula. This is an iconic image from Hubble in the visible wavelengths, and this is actually also an image from Hubble in near-infrared wavelengths. Well, Webb went one step further, looked at a little bit longer wavelengths, also took an image, and what I want to point out here is that these are exactly the same object and they look tremendously different. And the power of combining this image and that image and the next image gives us so much more information about the system. It's why we say that Webb is a complement, not a successor to Hubble, because they work together to tell you about this system. You need to understand the stars that are forming inside. You need to understand the gas and dust that are within these shells out of which planets form. And you only get all of that information by looking at multiple wavelengths. Um, you know, this is one of those things where if you showed a kid, this would be three different pictures and it's actually the exact same object. And then finally, and arguably most exciting, but it's almost exciting to me, is that Webb has found new molecules already. 
This is an example of a system, uh, this is, yeah, WAS39B. There are five molecules just in this image right here. So this is the spectrum of the atmosphere of an exoplanet. This exoplanet was already discovered, but Webb looked at it and found the presence of water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and sodium. To give you some context, this object had previously been studied by Hubble and some other ground-based telescopes, and they saw water. Webb's ability to see all of these different molecules simultaneously and very easily helps us be able to understand the complete atmosphere, not just a piece of it. If you know anything about our Earth's atmosphere, you know that there's oxygen and nitrogen and water vapor and methane and lots and lots of constituents. And it's only in understanding all of them together do we have any idea what comprises our atmosphere, why there are different temperature structures, why we have ozone, all of these things. We need Webb to be able to get the entire picture at once to be able to really understand exoplanet atmospheres. Now this is a hot Jupiter, which means that it's a very large planet. And so this was sort of the like low hanging fruit. Webb has already demonstrated, again, in its first six months, that we are actually able to measure the atmospheres of rocky planets. This planet is 0.99 the size of 0.99 I guess 99% of the size of the Earth. So this is a rocky planet. And well, the actual, what, what was discovered in the atmosphere of this planet was kind of um, boring, for lack of a better word. Uh, this shows the curve of the, ap of the atmosphere of the exoplanet in front of the star, demonstrating that Webb can study the atmospheres of rocky planets, which really was the uh, goal in this area of science. However, Webb doesn't just study planets outside of our solar system. It studies planets within our solar system. Um, this is actually the planned suite of objects that it will study in the next couple of years within our solar system. You can see it's all of the planets outside of, um, of its orbit from Mars on out, including the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt, and many of the moons. Uh, and you may or may not have seen some of these images already including that of Neptune that came out very shortly after uh, the, the, the observatory was commissioned. Here, what's amazing here is that not only are you seeing a lot of methane emission from the main planet, but you're also seeing the rings um, in incredible detail. And again, this was an image that my team just said, hey, let's look at Neptune, let's see if it's pretty. But the science that will be done with this image and on all of these planets is incredible because we have an up-close view with a giant telescope that is primed to look at the material that makes up planets in our, in our solar system. Materials like methane, materials like water vapor, materials like carbon dioxide. So we are, we are only beginning to see the potential in our solar system. And I can promise you that within the next two years, we're gonna have absolutely new discoveries about all of the planets in our own solar system. Um, and then finally, Webb actually, along with Hubble, observed the impact of the DART mission, the Double Asteroid Redirect Test mission in September. It observed it when the uh, spacecraft hit the asteroid, which is just kind of a really cool thing in my opinion, and an example of how missions work together to study objects together. Um, with the help of Hubble and Webb, they were able to confirm the change in orbit of the objects uh, and study the system and the materials within the system. Um, and then, because I'm running out of time to end, um, uh, just a little piece of how Webb, you know, and, and NASA has infiltrated pop culture. Um, it is important uh, to do these things, not just for the amazing science, but for what they do for humanity. Um, my favorite uh, headline ever um, was something to the effect of, Webb is what we needed after the pandemic to raise up humanity. Um, and, you know, from Coldplay to Times Square, uh, Webb has 
has given new life to people's inspiration, to people's you know backgrounds on their phones, uh, and to the possibility of discovery um, when we have access to such incredible tools, um, incredible teams to make them happen, uh, and um, just the ability to dream big, uh, just understand our universe. So that's it. <laughs>